So asynchronous programming is really important, especially when we do uh, user interactions. So we want to keep our applications responsive. Um, I'll go quickly through what it is and how to um, apply this properly in applications. I won't go into too much beginner stuff, so if you want to get more details later, just grab me here, I'll be around for the entire day. So I'm Philip Eckberg, um, I wrote a book, I'm a C-sharp and Xamarin MVP, I work as a senior software engineer at a place called invoice to go So enough about me, I'll be focusing on just writing some code and talking around how that changes the behavior of our applications. So I've got Visual Studio open, and this application that I've written up here, it's a simple Xamarin Android application from Visual Studio. Um, so if I just run this application, this is going to open up in the Xamarin Android player, and we'll see that it simply has a nice UI that lets me click Download RSS. That's going to go ahead and download some RSS from my blog and then present this in my application. As you see here, the, the experience isn't really the best. I click this button and like the UI freezes up. There's, there's not much that I can do about that. So how do we go about improving our application and making it better and making use of asynchronous programming? So asynchronous programming is all about allowing us to, for instance, show a loading indicator why some data is being loaded or processed. But before we add that, I want to have a look at what this, ap what this application is, in fact, doing. So when I'm clicking the Download RSS button, it's running this RSS button click event handler, which simply goes off and runs some method inside my application. So if we take a look at that, you'll see here that we're using a class called the web client. Now, if you've done any application development in the last two years, you've seen that web client isn't really used anymore. You'll most commonly see people using the HTTP client, for instance, which is asynchronous by default. However, let's say that we work with a legacy system and we're porting that into a portable class library. Then you'll most likely see things like this happening. So what I'm doing here is that I have this, this web client and hold on. And if we go ahead and just mark this here, you'll see that in this section here, I'm doing a few things. I'm setting up my web client, I'm downloading this string from my blog, and that's what's causing my application to be unresponsive. Now, what I want to do is to change this to be more asynchronous. The first thing that I see developers do quite often is to think that, well, if I just go ahead and mark my method as being async, that solves the problem. So now that I'm introducing the async keyword, a lot of developers think that this automatically makes everything asynchronous. So let's run this and see how the application behaves after doing that. Can I ask a quick sure. So, so, so you're asking if Xamarin allows us to do asynchronous operations? Yes. Um, so they are allowing us to do background threading and all that, just as you would be able to do on Windows and on, on iOS, for instance. You can do the same on Android. So Xamarin handles that for us. How that's implemented in Java and how that works in the back end, I don't really know and I don't care because it just works. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what it's doing here is that it's allowing me to run off an asynchronous operation. And I changed my method to being asynchronous. I, I told my application that, well, now you're on an asynchronous method, so let's click this button and see what happens. So still an unresponsive UI. We can see here that the button is not released and we're still getting an unresponsive UI. So in fact, adding this async keyword didn't really do any good at all. So behind the scenes here, it's doing a lot of things. So adding this keyword does change the, the, the application a lot, but it's not something that improves the UI of our application. So one more thing here, as, um, as mentioned before, our application could crash if we don't have an internet connection. If we do not have access to internet now, what would happen with the web client? Well, it would probably throw an exception. So what happens if I throw an exception in here? Well, you'd guess that the application crashes, right? Because every time we get an exception and we haven't caught that, it's going to crash the application. And just as that, it says, unfortunately, the application crashed. Now, if I go ahead and change this, so you can see here that I'm simply calling that method. So it's not really that weird that it's crashing the application, right? Now, what most developers would do is do a try and catch block, take this code and run that in the try and catch block, not rethrow the exception. And now let's rerun the application and see what happens. <laughs> 
you'd think that catching this exception like that would not crash the application. Well, if we click download RSS now, we we'll still have this behavior of, of a crashing application. So the reason behind that, without going into too much details of what happens when applying the async keyword, the thing to keep in mind here is this part up here. So we have async void up here, which is a big no-no. So we want to avoid doing async void in our applications because there's no way for the, um, the backend of the application or the, the runtime to tell us where the exception occurred. So what it's doing is that it's reporting that back to uh, the main thread and crashing the application. So if we mark something as async void and we throw an exception, there's no way to recover from that. And now we can solve this by changing the signature of the method. So adding the async keyword allows us to simply say that the method now returns a task instead of being void. So introducing a simple task is pretty much the same thing as saying that this method runs something, but it's not actually returning a value. So simply saying task is a representation of a method that does not return anything. As you see here, it's still compiling. We're getting some squigglies here telling us that we could improve th things. We'll get to that later. Now, of course, if I run the application, you'll see that we don't get the exception thrown anymore. So I run this here and nothing happens. It's super responsive and everything works much better. So it, it does feel like I have a better ex user experience, but now I'm not getting the proper data. So if we go ahead and have a look in the call of this, well, we're trying to catch the exception. But of course, if I set a breakpoint down here and run this application with the debugger attached and click the button, of course, we won't be able to catch that exception because we're not validating our task. So if I click this here, it won't go into that breakpoint. The reason for that being, we can see here that it adds this squeak list under this method call. It's simply telling us that you're calling an asynchronous method. It returns a task, but you're not validating that this operation completed successfully. So one way to do that is by introducing another keyword, which is the await keyword. So async and await are always used together. You would not mark a method as async unless you're also using the await keyword. So you'll see here now that I have to mark this as async void. And the reason for that is because this is a button click event handler. Now the event handlers have a signature that is predefined and they're also always returning void. So in this case, it's OK for us to mark this as being asynchronous and avoid method. The only issue here is that if there was an exception, we would not be able to recover from that. So simply don't have any code that could cause an exception. And you do that by wrapping everything in try catch blocks. Now, to validate that this call I did here did not throw anything, we introduced the await keyword. So I'm going to say, Validate that the work for downloading the RSS and updating the UI is done properly. So if I run this without the debugger, we get the same experience that we had before. I click download RSS here. We're catching that error. And we could present that to the UI if we so liked. And of course, if I run with the debugger, you'll see that we can step into that exception and see what caused that problem. So we improved the experience of developing the application and being able to catch exceptions, and we introduced the async and await keywords. However, if we remove this part here, where it's actually throwing the exception, we're now saying that this method here is asynchronous. It returns a task. We're validating that everything is OK. So would this make the application behave better and be quicker? Let's run it and see again. So we click this here. It's still unresponsive. And we can see that by the button color, it's not being changed back to the darker theme. So now that it's loaded the RSS and getting that back to the UI, it changes the button color. And we can now click it again if we'd like. So it's still not asynchronous. We still have this really bad experience in the application. The reason for that is this call here. So we're doing download string. And that simply is a synchronous call. And this is going to block the current thread that we're on until it's done processing. And lucky enough for us, there's an alternative way for us to, to download the string from the web. We can use an overload called download string task async. 
So as I mentioned before, you wouldn't use the web client nowadays. If you write a new application, you'd use the HTTP client. But in this case here, we're kind of simulating that we are working with a legacy system. So we could change this into download string async. But then we'd also have to change a few other things in here. So RSS is no longer the text representation of the RSS that we downloaded. So the line that we have here, we're saying, well, the RSS is equal to whatever we download from the web. But that is now represented as a task. So we have the asynchronous operation. If we hover this var keyword here, we'll see that, sorry, we'll see that it's simply returning a task. So we need a way to validate that that task finished properly, and we need to grab the value. We've already marked this method as being asynchronous. So what we can do now is simply going into um, using the await keyword here as well. Let me just change this here. There we go. So by introducing the await keyword here as well, I'm saying validate that we could download the data and give me the text that you got from the web. So I'll run this again. And I'll click the button. And you see here that we got a better experience. And once the data is being downloaded and everything is finished, it's going to present this to the UI. So you see here that I can click the button as many times as I'd like, so the UI is now responsive. If we had other things in the UI, another button, something else to do, we could be notified once all the data is available. So we're still not having this super duper experience in the application. It's, it doesn't show us a loading indicator or anything like that. So to improve that, I have something called show progress here. Uh, and if I just uncomment this here, I've introduced something called a progress. And I'm setting the message to be, please wait. I'm downloading the RSS. I'm going to show a loading indicator and saying, well, I'm downloading something. You can't do anything. And you can't cancel this operation. And once I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and hide that progress bar. So if we run this again, we'll see here that we get a much better experience. Clicking download RSS, it's showing me a loading indicator, and the user is going to be happy. Now, there are a lot of things that we can do here to improve the experience the next time they open the application. We could store this to a local database in SQLite. We could store this to disk, and then load up that as a cache the next time we run the application. And all of those operations are also asynchronous. So you'd write to SQLite, SQLite using query async, and you write to the file system using asynchronous operations as well. So it's really important to know where it's applicable to add the async and await keywords. So something that I didn't really mention is that what really goes on here behind the scenes is that it's setting up this entire machine that handles where it's currently running, what to run next, and everything about that is very complex, but we're not going to go into that. But the line here is executed after the task is completed, and we're back to the UI thread, and that's really important. So what we're doing here is that we're firing off a call to the web, which is on a separate thread, and then we're coming back to the UI thread and doing that work and being able to add that to the UI. So I'll show you what happens if we don't do that. Let's say that our click event handler was not marked as async. Sometimes you really want to run something synchronous, but you're calling an asynchronous method but maybe your UI layer is not capable of using async and await, and you really want to force a block. So something that you see a lot, or I see a lot, is that when you call an asynchronous method and you want to force that, you simply do wait. And what this is doing is that it's forcing the UI thread, in this case, to block until this asynchronous operation is done. Although if I click the Download RSS button now, uh, you'll see here that the UI is in fact, or the application in fact, crashed. So we reached something called the deadlock. So it's just prompting me to close the application because it's crashed. There's no way to return from that. Simply put, what's happening here is that we're blocking the same thread that everything, this big machine that is keeping track of all the work that we're doing asynchronously, we're blocking that from notifying us that it's done. So a way for us to, to work around that is to wrap this in a task.run. So task.run is a way for us to start off an asynchronous operation and run something on a different thread 
and just let it run there, and then we can block the UI thread. So this is going deep into the more complex things of async and await, and you kind of have to understand what goes on behind the scenes to fully comprehend what's, what's really going on here. But you'll see here that when I click download RSS, it does block the application. And after a while, it's going to release that and say, well, we're done now. The button is back to, oops, it's, it's being a bit too slow. Um, let's just say that that worked. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Although there was one problem. It cannot change the RSS text. Because now, what we did was that we we're saying that this download RSS and update UI, it's running on a separate thread. And what we're doing, even though we're doing async and await, when we're doing await here, after the await keyword, I mentioned before that we're back to the calling thread, right? But in this case, that's another thread than the UI. So we're trying to do a cross thread, but we didn't get an exception. And we saw that before that we need to validate that tasks are finished properly. But we're not doing that here. So how would we do that? Well, we could say that this is an asynchronous method, and we can await that as well. This is where it starts to get complex. We can have asynchronous lambdas, and we can validate everything like this here. But you would never block, so you'll never have that problem. Just make sure that you never use the wait keyword, and you always use await and async together. So just a few considerations. Don't mark your void methods as being asynchronous methods, because that will end up being a problem. You will, for, for some reason, your application is going to crash sometimes. You're going to have exceptions that will certainly cause big troubles. And we saw that task swallow exceptions. So unless we add the await keyword, we will not be able to know if there was an exception or not. And calling wait is an easy path to deadlocking. So Every time you call dot result or dot wait, you should really be careful about how that is being done. If you really need to block something, just wrap whatever you call in a task.run, and most of the times that will work. And we should follow the naming convention. So we saw that I called my method download RSS and update UI, but once I changed that to being an asynchronous method, I should have updated the name to being async as well. And that might seem a bit silly, but if you work with a big application and you have thousands of method calls and you're just developing, you, you want to know which ones are asynchronous and which ones are not. And we shouldn't lie in our applications. So in my case here, if I wanted both a synchronous version of download RSS and an asynchronous one, I shouldn't just wrap the synchronous one in a task.run and call it async. And we saw that the continuation, of course, which is what happens after the await keyword, that's executed on the UI thread. So we didn't do any magic to be able to update the UI and change the text on our Android application. We just saw that it was very seamless and very linear in the application. Any questions? I'll stick around for the entire day and ask, answer any async questions you might have. And if you want to get a deep dive into this, I have a Pluralsight course that you can have a look at. And if you don't have a subscription, I'd be happy to give you a 30-day unlimited pass. Um, so just hit me up afterwards, and I'll give you that. Thanks.